When it comes to governing, it was Maura Healy's biggest week yet. On Monday at a YMCA in Lynn, Healy unveiled a sprawling tax cut plan totaling nearly $750 million, bigger than the one former Governor Charlie Baker pushed unsuccessfully last year. As Governor Healy noted in her remarks, her plan contains a wide array of proposals aimed at everyone from residents of low or limited means to higher earners who might be thinking about taking their talents elsewhere. Everywhere we go, the lieutenant governor and I hear about the cost of living and how it's impacting communities, how it's skyrocketing past people. The young mom who wants to return to her dream job but can't afford childcare. The recent college grad who can't make both his rent and his student loan payments. The senior who wants to stay in the home where they raise their family but can't keep up with property taxes. The small business owner contemplating moving to another state that has less burdensome taxes. That tax plan is a centerpiece of Healy's first ever state budget proposal, which she released on Wednesday. That blueprint totals $55.5 billion. In addition to cutting taxes, the governor wants to ramp up spending on the environment and energy, let some adults 25 and older go to community college for free, and allow inmates in the Massachusetts Department of Correction system to make free phone calls. For a look at how Governor Healy's budget squares with candidate Healy's campaign promises and vision and what it tells us about her still evolving political identity, I'm joined by Lisa Kaczynski, the author of Politico's Massachusetts Playbook, Charlie Chip of the Pioneer Institute and Phineas Baxendall of the Massachusetts Budget and Policy Center. Thank you all for being here. Charlie, Pioneer has, by the standards of Massachusetts politics, a more conservative take on budgetary matters and other matters. What did Pioneer like and what didn't you like in terms of what you heard from Healy this week? Well, I think there was a lot to like. Uh, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, she has been talking a lot about affordability and I think she made significant progress on affordability uh, with many of the things that she which she did. Uh, I think that there is affordability is different from competitiveness. And I think that there was some good moves toward making Massachusetts competitive, although I'm not sure really enough to move the needle on that. Um, I really liked the um, uh, the uh, career um, in, uh, technology uh, career tech institutes um, which really, I think, leverages our very strong uh, uh, vocational technical schools. Um, I'm a little leery about the community college piece, simply because I'd like to see more of that um, uh, moved into the where it could be into the voc tech schools. Because you know, our community colleges only have about a 21 percent completion rate. They are not real strong at this point, uh, but uh, we'll see. There is, but there certainly is plenty to like. I think in there. Phineas Baxendall, Mass Budget, has a more progressive take on this stuff. What does Mass Budget like in terms of what Healy had to say this week, and what do you think she missed or maybe got wrong? Well, on the tax side, there there is a lot to like. The biggest uh, piece of it is this uh, child and family tax credit, which would be $600 uh, that even people could even people who are already getting a refund would get as a as a check and it's for any child under 13 as well as for dependent adults a senior or, or mm -hmm. a disabled adult living at home and that's going to make a real difference for how affordable Massachusetts can be what we didn't like in the tax package is there are these two really big cuts very narrowly targeted just on the wealthiest so the uh, really deep estate tax cut uh, uh, eliminating all the taxes on estates uh, from $1 million to $3 million. Right. And then the biggest amount goes to estates that are over $3 million, actually, get to fully collect a $182,000 tax cut for, for anyone with that. And then there's also this tax cut for short-term capital gains. From 12% down to... Uh, down to 5%. 5% right? And that's chiefly things like, you know, People who are flipping real estate, people who are doing spe more speculative financial types of transactions. It's, it's only for these short-term investments, and it's really tightly, tightly concentrated. About 90% of it is the top 5%. So it's really, really, if we want to reduce the wealth, wealth gaps and the racial wealth gaps in, the, in this state, that is not the way to do it. Lisa Kaczynski, I know you've been keeping tabs on different reactions from different sectors to Healy's tax plan and budget proposal. Has anything stood out to you in terms of who is happy about different pieces and who's unhappy? 
Definitely. So one of two of the major areas of investment that the governor highlighted this week was in energy and in environmental affairs and also in education. And that set up this really interesting split screen um, between reactions from kind of those two areas of advocacy. People who advocate for, um, you know, climate and energy and environmental, um, you know, progress on on combating climate change, they're thrilled by this. Um, you have one of the state senators who sits and kind of leads these energy and environmental committees um, up on Beacon Hill. He said this was the best budget that he's seen to address these from the executive because the governor is putting, you know, one percent of the state budget uh, towards energy and environmental agencies for the first time. The other big investment is in education that she's making, but that's where you start to see kind of a difference in reaction. You know, some education groups, they're cheering her for fully funding the Student Opportunity Act and, and things like that, but they're also worried about those, those tax breaks that she's proposed, particularly the estate tax and slashing the short-term capital gains rate, as we've talked about. And they're basically worried about, they're calling them these quote-unquote giveaways um, back to the wealthy when that money they feel could be going towards more with education, especially with the governor taking a lot of the extra money from um, that's coming in through the millionaire's tax and putting it towards early education and higher education, hmm. but not necessarily any extra money towards K-12 education. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, Charlie Chippio, I want to come back to the term competitiveness, which you mentioned a couple minutes ago, and, and talk a little more about what that actually means. It seems like it's yeah. the word of the moment yeah. right now. You know, we, we uh, heard Healy discuss it when she was rolling out the tax plan. She talked about it at the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce uh, the other day. Here she is using it in her tax announcement. And Lynn, take a quick look. We have to acknowledge that there are some aspects of our current tax system that make Massachusetts an outlier. When we don't keep up with other states, you see, we put our own competitiveness at risk. So, Charlie, since you brought it up to begin with, how do you define competitiveness? And do you think that in balance or on balance, everything that Healy rolled out this week would, in fact, make Massachusetts more competitive? Well, first, I want to I want to thank the governor for the perfect lead-in <laughs> to my comments. Uh, look, here's what I think. Um, this year, or in the last year, uh, about half the states either have or uh, are in the process of cutting taxes. And let me tell you, I am not like a cut taxes to zero kind of guy, but I mean, that it, that is kind of the reality. Um, and there is one state, Massachusetts, that has raised taxes. With the and millionaire's that, tax, oh, right? Right, yeah. and and I think that and I think that one of the things that we have to look at uh, in, in terms of competitiveness is look uh, over 25 years we lost a billion dollars a year in adjusted gross income in Massachusetts in net out migration from 10, 2010 to 2020 that amount increased six fold so more than 70 percent of it is to uh, New Hampshire. And, uh, and Florida. Uh, the most loss is in Middlesex County, which abuts New Hampshire. So I think that in that context of all those things, when you look at Massachusetts being of only one of 12 states that even has a, uh, 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 an estate tax and that we have uh, the lowest threshold for an estate tax uh, of the 12 that has it, Connecticut just raised their threshold to 12.3 million, which is the which is the federal number. Um, you know, these are things we have to do. The same with the the same uh, with the uh, uh, with the short term capital gains. We have the highest short term capital gains uh, in the country, and I think that you know while. Uh, certainly, Phineas described part of what short-term capital gains taxes. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of people who aren't just looking to sort of make a buck and shaft people who are investing in Massachusetts in short-term capital gains. We have 110,000 people who have left Massachusetts just since the pandemic. Uh, uh, we are we really have to take steps to try and keep people here okay, and that, maintain this economy. That, that's, I think that embodies what you're talking about when you talk about competitive, uh, competitiveness. Phineas, do you agree with that? I mean, do you accept that as a, a term of value and the definition that Charlie just laid out? 
So I think competitiveness is a consideration, but I would describe it really differently than okay. this. So Massachusetts has an issue with not enough workers here, right? That's, I think, something that's a pretty well accepted that we have a problem with finding workers. Now, we have a problem finding workers not because rich people are, are fleeing our shores. We have a problem because people have trouble living a middle-class existence here. They can't, uh, they can't live, uh, they can't find housing that they can afford, or if they can find housing, it's not near schools that they believe in, or the commutes are too large. We have to make the investments on the public side to address this. You know, Charlie was talking about vocational schools. There are these long wait lists for vocational schools. It costs at least $5,000 more per student per year to uh, educate someone in a, well, in a good way in a vocational school. This costs money. It takes it on the spending side. So we need the investment money to do this. Giving $182,000 to somebody who's rich enough that they can decide where they want to live based on their quality of life is not the way to do it. Okay. Uh, Lisa, there was a theory making the rounds last year after the legislature did not pass Governor Baker's tax cut proposals that maybe they wanted to hold off and cue Maura Healy, who was presumed, you know, the, it was presumed she was going to be the next governor, uh, cue her up for a big win early in her tenure. Have you seen or heard anything this week that gives credence to that theory? Or maybe does the opposite? One of the factors last year was also Chapter 62F. I mean, do you remember that there there were budget, um, there were tax relief proposals, sorry, I should say, that were in negotiations from the House and the Senate that had pieces of Governor Baker's and had proposed other things like one-time rebates. Those had, were very much nearing the finish line uh, right when Chapter 62F kind of hit. And then House Speaker Ron Mariano at that point was the person who kind of became the stick in the mud being like, we you know, don't know what's going to happen with the economy. We need to hold back. We're already giving $3 billion back to tax. I do remember that. What stands out, as I think back on it, is how that, that law seemed to surprise everyone except Governor Baker. It was like they didn't even know that this possibility was out there. But I interrupted you. No, it's that's a good reminder. So now what we're seeing from Speaker Mariano is a little bit more willingness, uh, it looks like, to play ball on tax relief. Uh, his response to the governor's, the new governor's proposal was, you know, there are some good things in it, some things that we have proposed before. There are some new things we have to look at. Overall, he seems ready, more ready to move forward with it now that there's a clearer economic picture for the state heading into the new fiscal year. I will say, though, that one thing that is coming up this week is that, um, the uh, basically there with the end of the federal uh, COVID emergencies that are happening, mm -hmm. the state's going to have to take on more uh, to kind of keep programs going that the feds had helped pay for, like rental assistance, child care subsidies, that type of stuff. It expanded in the pandemic. The speaker is now starting to cast a little bit of doubt about what the state can really afford in that way. Mm -hmm. And it will be interesting to see how that factors into tax relief. Yeah, that'll be fascinating to watch. Lisa Kaczynski, Charlie Chippio, Phineas Baxendall, thank you all for talking this through.